27th March 2023. So I see that we have present councillors Alison, Anderson and Brown. I have an apology from councillor Carmichael and I see that councillor Scott is participating remotely as a substitute. Um, we have councillors Chalmers, Clark, Convery, councillor Cooper. I see that Councillor Cooper is participating remotely. Um, I see that we have present Councillors Cowan, Devlin, Fagan, Miller, sorry, Ferguson, Miller, Horsham. Just checking to see if we have Councillor Keat. Not yet. I'll, I'll check that during the course of the meeting. Um, I have apologies from Councillor Eileen Logan, and I see that Councillor Kerr is here um, substituting for her. Um, we have present Councillors Loudon. Hugh MacDonald, Ian McAllen, Catherine McClymont, Kenny McCreary, Leslie MacDonald, Mark McGeever, David McLachlan, Richard Nelson, Mo Razak, Kirsten Robb, John Ross, David Shearer and Margaret Walker. There are a number of um, officers present at the meeting. I don't think I have missed anyone out, so with that, Chair, I'll pass back to you for today's business. OK, thank you very much. Can I come now to item one on declarations of interest? And can I ask if anyone wishes to make a declaration of interest? There are no declarations of interest. So can I move now to item two, which is on the minutes of the previous meeting? Uh, can I ask, are there any questions on the minutes of the previous meeting? Not seeing any questions on the previous meeting, so can I ask that we approve those minutes as a correct record? Are we agreed? We're agreed. Can I come now to item three on the revenue budget monitoring and ask Paul Manning to speak to the report? Thanks, Chair. So this is the revenue budget monitoring report and it takes us to the 24th of February. So it's getting towards the end of the financial year now. Uh, and again, this, this paper is simpler than a number of the reports that I've brought you across the course of this year. Uh, it refers at 4.1 to the probable outturn position, which was an underspend of £4.696 million. That's what we expect the position to be at the end of the year, and that remains the case. At the top of the second page of the report, it refers to the position at the 24th of February and there being an underspend of £1.875 million. That's not an addition to that probable outturn position. That's us just moving towards that year-end position. The paper also covers the position for the housing revenue account and the, the place of that at the 24th of February is that it's at a break-even position. So that's covered in Section 6. So, Chair... Going back to the recommendations, it's looking for noting of the outturn position. It's looking for noting of the underspend position as at the 24th of February on the general fund revenue account and that break-even position on the housing revenue account at that date as well. And I'm happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask if there are any questions on that report? If you could indicate now. And I'll come to Councillor Allison. Thanks, Chair. Um, Regarding the transfers to reserves for future budget strategies, has any of that been allocated towards the uh, rates budget that will now be rates budget, the rates bill we will now be getting because assets have been handed back um, to the council? And I don't think was part of the budget process. And secondly, will there be any costs before the 1st of April on these halls being handed back? Uh, and what are we doing to negate these costs? Paul, do you want to pick that up? Well, I'm happy to pick that up, Chair. So the, the position here is for the current financial year. It's for year 2022-23. So the paper makes reference to the fact that that was used in putting together the 2023-24 budget. So if you go back to the budget paper, there's, there's reference in that paper to that amount of money and how that was being used. So that is being used for the 2023-24 budget in its totality. It's not attributed uh, to, to individual things. There are, if you go to the paper, it's, it's specific about where the money's being used in that budget report. So you can go back and see that, and I'm happy to pick that up in terms of questions. 
In terms of the rates bill, there's no additional rates bill included within this paper because this is about year 2022-23. The cost that you're describing would relate to next year, to 2023-24. I'm aware that you've asked a question about the rates uh, budget on properties that are being returned, and I'll, I'll come back to you this week with an, an answer on that, Councillor Allison. Thank you. Uh, can I come to Councillor Robb? Morning, everyone. Um, I think, uh, thanks to the paper, Paul, uh, most papers, financial papers, now highlight the massive impact on energy price increases on our budget uh, in revenue, both for SLLC and SLLC. Could ask for an update on how the Council is getting on taking forward the actions in the energy efficiency motion that Ross Clark and I brought to the Council in September. Thank you. Okay, so a, a number of the papers that we've had across the period of this year have referenced the increases in energy costs. So that's been both in the current year's monitoring, which this is, and in the papers for future years. Uh, so uh, while I said at the start of the paper, this is simpler because I'm, I'm focusing on the core messages, I'm happy to go back and pick up those aspects around cost for you and how they're progressing. What we are likely to see moving through 23-24 and into two, year 2024-25 is a continued increase in energy costs. Right? But I'll uh, continue to brief that when we're, we're talking about the 24-25 budget. In terms of the action plan that you refer to, I'm, again, I'm happy to pick that up and give you a detailed response out with the committee. Thanks, Councillor. Okay, are there any other questions? I'm not seeing any other questions. Can I uh, therefore uh, ask that we agree the report? Okay, and we'll come now to item four, which is a capital budget monitoring report, and I'll come back to Paul Manning. Yep, thanks, Chair. So again, this is the capital paper. This is to the 24th of February as well. The paper at the foot of the first page references the size of our capital programme is £78.396 million. There is an adjustment in the appendix to the papers, and that's on page 23 at appendix 1, uh, and that is a, about money being directed to a project for Shatler Row allotments, but the adjustment that you can see in the appendix references the fact that this isn't going to be spent in the current year. So that proposes an adjustment of £180,000. On the second page of the paper, it picks up about what we now think we are going to spend against that programme to the end of the year. And it references previous reports of an outturn of £73 million, which would mean an underspend of £5.3 million against that budget. So that remains the case, and there's a bit of explanation provided there at 4.5 and 4.6. At 4.7, it re uh, refers to a list of the main projects that make up that underspend. And again, there's a list of those in Appendix 4 uh, of those underspending projects. It gives a bit of detail, and it references a completion date for each of them. So in the main, these are things that aren't happening in 22 23 but well in 23, 24, and the money will be spent in that year as well. So the paper then finishes off by covering the housing programme. So there's a housing programme of 66 and a third million pounds. Uh, at the foot of page 20, it refers to an underspend of eight million pounds against that housing programme. And at the top of page 21, the reasons are given why that's happened. So there is a reference there to the fact that people from property services did have to be diverted away from capital investment to tackle uh, urgent flooding damage after the severe weather event that we had in December. And there's also a reference at 5.4 to a project which was, uh, handed, which was delayed in terms of its handover to the council, and that's had an impact on when the money's going to be spent as well. So going back to the recommendations within the paper, it looks for noting of that period 12 position on uh, both of those programmes, general fund and the housing programme, and approval to that adjustment. 
that is included within the papers. So, again, Chair, thank you and happy to take any questions. Okay, can I ask if there are any questions on that item? And can I come to Councillor Nelson? Thank you, Chair. Um, just on Larko Leisure Centre and the new build, I'm just looking to see if we could get a level of commitment to allow the resource to move forward um, to bridge that external funding gap or our funding gap that we need to get the leisure centre to where we need it to be. Um, it's great to see that Larko Leisure Centre is still in there, but it's sat in there and hasn't moved. Um, so how are we going to move it forward? Because we need it to move forward as soon as possible. Um, and I'm looking for some commitment for that to move forward, Chair. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I think from my point of view, we put this in front of the Council just the other, the other week when we approved the budget. So the commitment from ourselves as an administration is to take forward plans for those new leisure centres, starting with Lark Hall. Everyone's aware of the budget constraints and the volatility in supply chains and all those other challenges that we're having to grapple with. But the position of the Council, and I think the position our officials are working to, is that we understand there is a budget gap and we're going to do everything we can to try and close it. Um, and potentially with an update on that in the coming months. Unless anyone wants to correct me if I'm wrong or provide any further update, I think that is the current position in relation to Lark Hall Leisure Centre. Could I come now to Councillor Rob? Thank you. Um, so to identify, um, just to ask, capital projects may have a positive or negative impact on uh, climate emissions. Can I ask what the process is where capital projects are expected to have to increase emissions? What the process is to identify those emissions and to either avoid or mitigate any increase in emissions in line with our council plan? Okay, how happy to that. Uh, when we brought forward the budget for 2023-24, there are impact assessment statements included within that. And we did have a conversation about that time at that time in terms of how we could look to improve that process moving forward. So across the course of this year, Councillor Rob, I'll come back uh, and include yourself in the process and come back to, to committee and council outlining how we can look to refine that moving forward. Thank you. I was just going to see if Stephen Gibson wanted to add anything to that. Yes, thanks, Councillor. Yeah, moving forward, of course, we've, we've got an affordable housing programme, which over the next five years will deliver an extra 1,300 houses. Um, as part of that, and going through the planning process, we'll be looking to maximise renewable energies. We'll be looking to do what we can to reduce carbon emission moving forward, but not just in a new building, a refurbishment programme as well for the next five years. We'll be doing as much as we can um, to, to contribute towards our net zero aspirations, councillor. OK, can I ask, are there any other questions on that item? I don't see any other questions. Can I ask that we agree the report? OK, come now to item five on additional funding from Scottish Government and other external sources and come back to Paul Manning to speak to that item. Paul. Thanks, Chair. So there's additional funding uh, detailed within this paper of £6.159 million. Pounds. That's uh, laid out in detail in the appendix, which is on page 31. So the, the two biggest amounts in there, both coming from the Scottish Government, one's a contribution to the Teachers' Pay Award, so that's in the current year, and that's at a level of £2.146 million. And the second one is in next year, uh, and that's £3.8 million, which is the funding for the discretionary housing payments that the Council makes. So again, Chair, happy to take any questions on that. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions on that item? Not seeing any questions on that item. So can I ask if we agree the report? Can I come now to item six, which is the Police Scotland local plan? Um, I'm going to invite Stephen Gibson to introduce the report, but we also have with us uh, Chief Superintendent Stephen Dolan and Superintendent Andrew Thompson uh, to deliver a presentation uh, on behalf of Police Scotland. But I'll come in the first instance to Stephen Gibson. Thank you, Chair. So the purpose of this report is to seek approval for the Lanarkshire Police Plan for a three-year period from 2023 to 2026. 
If approved, this will replace the existing plan, which was approved by the Executive Committee in March 2020. Section 3 of the report provides much of the background. It informs us this is a panned Lanarkshire plan that has been developed by Police Scotland's Lanarkshire Division. So it covers North Lanarkshire and the South Lanarkshire local authority areas. It advises us that this is a statutory requirement to prepare a plan and that it conveys the priorities locally that tie into national priorities. Um, so these are linked to strategic aims of, of Police Scotland. And also confirms that it's required to be approved by the Executive Committee of the Council. Section 5 of the report summarises the proposed policing priorities to 2026, and it confirms that these have followed a period of public consultation, and we'll hear more about that very shortly. From a governance perspective, the plan was approved by the South Lanarkshire um, Safer, Safer South Lanarkshire Board on the 13th of March 2023. As always, the recommendations are in Section 2. You'll see the committee have been asked to, to note the plan, but you're also been asked to approve it prior to its publication in April. However, before doing so, I'm all, as you say, we're joined by colleagues from Police Scotland. Um, Superintendent Andy Thompson is going to give us a presentation and will be happy to answer any questions. But before so, can I hand you over to Chief Superintendent Stephen Dolan, please? Thank you. Yep, thank you very much and thanks for the opportunity, Chair and Members, to present to you today. It's, I'm Stevie Dolan, I'm the Divisional Commander for Police Scotland in Lanarkshire. Uh, and along with Andy, I've been working on developing the police plan. Uh, I would just want to make some opening remarks before Andy takes us through a brief presentation, if you don't mind, and clearly happy to take any questions afterwards. Uh, first, first thing I would want to say to you as Members, you're probably aware through your own local engagement and feedback from constituents that demand on policing is changing. Uh, we do operate in a challenging environment, but uh, overall about 20% of our demand relates to crime. Uh, and that is a significant reduction uh, in, in, uh, over a sustained period of time. So only around a fifth of the incidents that Police Scotland colleagues deal with now relate to criminality across South Lanarkshire. The majority of the incidents that we deal with are around vulnerability, public protection, uh, and people in crisis. And I think it's fair to say that uh, as we come out of the main COVID period, as an agency, we've probably filled a gap that others previously filled in relation to, to people with vulnerabilities within the community. And that's something that we're engaging actively with partners around. But I just want to add that context around the changing demand on Police Scotland. Uh, if you look at the elements of crime that we do deal with, criminality across Scotland has also changed. So since 31 years ago, when I joined the police service, uh, and most of the crimes that we dealt with were within the public domain, it was criminality within streets and, and public areas, a lot of the criminality that we deal with now is invisible to the public. It takes place online, in terms of online fraud or online indecent images. Uh, it also takes place within public, uh, within people's houses. So whether it's sexual crime, or whether it's domestic abuse or domestic violence, uh, many or the majority of the crime that we deal with now is not within the public domain. So that presents us with a number of challenges. Uh, whilst you and I will always want police officers visible within the community, that will never change. A lot of our activity does have to take place now within that space which isn't visible to the public. So prior to taking up my current post last year, I had responsibility for cybercrime within Scotland. And that activity is not visible to anyone, but takes place within all of our communities on a daily basis, including in South Lanarkshire. And just briefly, the operating context that we uh, find ourselves in at the minute is along the same lines as yourselves as local authority in terms of budget allocation. Uh, you, you might be aware that our Chief Constable presented to the Police Authority recently, and, and he said that Police Scotland will have to make some real tough decisions, the same as many local authorities, given the funding allocation. So what does that mean for us in South Lanarkshire? What that is likely to mean is a reduction in officer numbers, or a redesign of how we allocate police officers within the area. Now, those are live discussions, uh, which haven't yet been concluded. But I think as Divisional Commander, uh, the commitment that I will always give is prioritising visible policing within communities. 
And as I say, having served as an officer for 31 years myself, I can say with a high level of confidence that community policing is the bedrock of policing in Scotland. And the commitment that I would give you personally uh, is that as your commander, I would seek to maintain that as much as I possibly can. Uh, that's not to pretend that things aren't going to have to change within policing in Lanarkshire, because they are. Uh, and what I would suggest is that we present today a long-term strategic plan over a th that we would seek your support and approval for over a three-year period. Andy, myself and other colleagues are in the process of developing a delivery framework which would allow us to deliver that with the challenges that we will face over the coming period. And should the plan receive your support today, we will take it back on a regular basis to the Safer South Lanarkshire Board, where we will face scrutiny on the delivery of that plan. I would just leave my remarks at this point, if you don't mind, as I say, if we can allow Andy to take us through a brief presentation and then happy to take any questions. But thank you. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, putting us on the agenda and giving us the time to, to go through it. I do feel that both Stevens have stolen, stolen the entirety of the presentation and there's not much left to, for me to go through. But it, in, in the nature of this, uh, we'll just put it on screen. I'm unable, because of the firewall security of this computer, to share it. So we're going to have to do a bit, of, a bit of coordination as to how we get this to you. So this is the plan that will come into effect uh, this weekend. If it's approved today, it comes into effect this weekend and runs for three years. It is, as, as Stevie next to me has said, uh, is a statutory requirement. If you move on to the next slide, please. What we'll do is go through a little bit of the background about it, how we identified the priorities that, we, that feature in the plan, the difference between old and new, because there is a marked difference, our delivery plan, take any questions uh, you may have, any clarifications. Next one, please. So the Police Scotland National Plan on a page is, is on the screens in front of you. And you'll see at the, at the top, you have the, the vision, the purpose, and our values. Our values, interestingly, are set in legislation, fairness, integrity, respect, and human rights. Only people in the UK that have that. So it's really important that we, we all remember that. But what is interesting is, because it fits in a neat line, the purpose of policing. This, again, is legislative. So it says on there, the purpose of policing is to improve the safety and well-being of people, places, and communities in Scotland. You could take out policing and put in public sector into that. So we're all doing that on a collaborative basis. But what that doesn't give you is the next sentence. Because, the, well, that is an incomplete sentence because the continuation of that, the next word is and. And it goes on to say, work in collaboration with others uh, where at all possible to be visible and accessible to local communities and work together in a manner that prevents and detects crime and disorder in the community. And that's really important that it is about prevention focused, working with others and being visible in the local community, all things we would want, I'm sure. The strategic police priorities, the six of them are set by Scottish ministers from which we determine at a national level what our four priorities are, and Stevie's taken us through pretty much by his introduction what those are. And then we've got five outcomes and 15 objectives. What, everything we do locally has to feed into that, which is, is again important. Could you put it on to the next one, please? So that takes us into the context, and both Stevens have given us some good introduction around this. Could you put the first one on, please? So the financial contraction, we know that in terms of our budget, six out of every seven pounds in our entire budget goes on just police officers. So it's really heavy. That's not IT, it's not vehicles, it's, it's not uh, our estates or buildings. It is literally putting bobbies on the beat for want of a far better expression. Our number of 17234 police officers across Scotland was a commitment for many years and that, that came in just about 2007, 2008, by 2009, we were at that number, maintained that number, but over the last 15 months, we've seen a marked reduction. And now today sits at 16,600. To put that into context, one in 25 police officers that served the communities of Scotland, a little over a year ago, no longer exists. And that's purely as a reduction in, uh, in finances. Uh, but what we always remember, and you see this banded about a lot, Police Scotland costs the communities of Scotland, £200 million less than our predecessors did, which was four police forces, or the smaller ones, which is significant. And our financial case in 2011 was that we would return £1.1 billion 
by 2026. We're actually on target for 2.2 billion. So my plea to any elected members in the room would be, can we get a wee bit more of that back so that we can balance the books a bit? As Stevie said next to me, the, sorry, next one, please, sorry. The changing nature of policing, we've spoken about uh, cyber crime, cyber, cyber enabled crime, and we've said the front line is no longer the street for policing. The front line can be the bedroom, it's the kitchen, it's the private space. And then we wrestle with how do you prevent and detect things that are done out with the remit of the public domain, where there may well be no witnesses, where there's, there may be limited opportunities uh, to engage in the family setting. It is very difficult, it is challenging. And we, we also encourage reporting on a scale we've never done before. We look back a little bit and we think about the way we used to ask about domestic abuse. I think we're in a really good place in terms of the volume of reports, because we always got what is happening and what's reported to police. I think that gap is narrowing significantly. And that's something now we're do, dealing with fraud and with sexual crime. You know, I've said to the Safer South Lancashire Board before, only one in three crimes of rape is reported within the month it occurred. So that, of course, presents challenges. And of course, everything about that is complexity. All those cases, they take a long time. You need specialists to do that. Uh, next one, please. So the demand for policing services, as Stevie has said, we're sitting about 480, uh, oh, sorry, 180,000 incidents a year, which equates for Lanarkshire alone, the whole of Lanarkshire, to uh, just short of 500 a day, which is significant, 19% of which result in a crime report being raised. So it is vulnerability, it is mental health, and we have that displaced demand as stresses and strains on the wider public sector see us stepping into that role. Um, the ne next one, please. Uh, but one thing we do have, and I genuinely believe us, and it is our privilege together to be leaders within our organisation in Lanarkshire, I think we've got an outstanding relationship with partners and an exceptional workforce, all of whom are, are committed to delivering for the citizens and communities of Lanarkshire. Next one, please. Sorry, you're going to get really fed up with me saying this. <laughs> so how do we come to the priorities that we presently have? You may as well just click a few in a row and we'll just go right along them. And that's the last one. So informal consultation, that was just boots on the ground, going out, talking to people, talking to those people who can't access surveys, the community groups who we get together and have a discussion with, then we analyse all that data, then we draft a plan, then it went out for formal consultation. Uh, that consultation closed in February and there wasn't much of a difference about what we'd identified through chatting with the community and what came back in form of formal consultation. And then we take it to the scrutiny boards for North and South, uh, both of whom are approved on the 6th and 13th of uh, this month. And then this of course been the final stage. So that's how we come to the priorities. I'd like to go on, please. So this was our old plan. And what you see in amongst it, yes, we have the five strategic outcomes that we must feed into. And yes, in the middle are areas of focus. And on the left, if we do this back to front, the four local priorities. But what's interesting about the old plan, and neither Steve or I were, he were here when it was created, uh, it doesn't really talk. It was, a, it, was, it was in a different time. And then that was during covid that that plan was implemented. But of course, things like tackling house breaks and acquisitive crime, so many people were in their house. That, 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 that obviously fell. Public protection and risk of harm, a lot of people were in their house and then we didn't get a lot of reports and then the reports went up considerably a few months into uh, lockdown. Reducing violence and disorder, the whole onus of that uh, changed completely and reducing the harm caused by substance misuse, when we're talking about drug deaths, still a real problem, and it really needs a multi-agency response. So that was what we did have, but it was very crime-focused. And as we've said, 19% of our calls are, are resulting in a crime report being raised. So the other 81% is what this, the space that Stevie and I wanted to step into. Go on to the new one, please. So this is the new one, slightly different, more balanced, I would suggest. Still the five strategic outcomes, but our local priorities, in the first sense, protecting our communities, that's a traditional crime. You know, your violent crime, your antisocial behaviour, which we know that the council are very keen on, uh, sexual crime, acquisitive crime, and organised crime. You know, we're just having a discussion about organised crime uh, just before this meeting uh, started. And then secondly, safeguarding our citizens. So you move a step back slightly from 
pure criminality into that space of the harm caused by drugs and alcohol. And yes, it tips into criminality, but there's so much harm that precedes that, that we could get into that preventative space. Gender-based abuse, I've chosen that particular phrase because I think it's wider than just violence against women and girls. There has to be a wider piece than, than that. Uh, online safety, as Steve's already alluded to, is just, you know, uh, it's so difficult, you know, the internet, the policing of the internet, and where that goes into human rights and thought is, is, is challenging. Uh, protecting our most vulnerable, we see we've got the ageing society, uh, and more dependency on public services, and of course, the mental health across our communities. And lastly on that one, road safety, particularly relevant when I got the stats through yesterday, talking about areas in, in Clydesdale, for example, hotspots down there, about where we can improve road safety. Uh, and then all of this is founded upon enhancing our service, and that's about our own workforce, because if our workforce isn't right to walk out the door, they don't have any hope of serving the citizens' communities of Lancashire to their full effectiveness. So we need to look at ways in which we can continuously improve the amount of legislation that's coming in, the changing dynamics, our workforce wellbeing, mental health within policing. It is a big thing. The number one reason for people being absent from work in Lanarkshire Division of Police Scotland today is stress. We've got to do something about that meaningfully. And that's why it's on there, so that we're held to account by the scrutiny board externally to say, what are you doing about that? And then operational resilience, that's about getting our structure in a place with diminished resources to make sure they are most effective. So, thank you. And then moving on, how do we do, just go through all of those, please, is about just until the last one fills up. Uh, so we've set the objectives, then it's down to the activities. We're going through this, this process just now. And, you know, Steve and I spoke just as recently as yesterday about this, about having a superintendent who would lead on each. We've got 21 areas. We'll split those up between us and get our chief inspectors to deliver on a pan Lanarkshire basis on a whole range of things. And then the milestones. So the first thing is to understand where we are with each of these 21 areas. What's our desired end result that serves best the communities? And then mapping out a process to get us from A to B. And then, of course, taking it to scrutiny. And we've been perhaps over-ambitious with scrutiny in terms of, you know, Police Scotland as an entity is probably the most scrutinised body in, in the public sector. But in Lanarkshire, we want to be at the forefront of that because we welcome legitimate scrutiny. Getting the elected reps, give us a hard time, genuinely, give us a hard time. Ask those challenging questions. We want to have an internal and external challenge culture where everyone's free to speak their mind with a view to improving policing. And then our performance measures will be more outcome than output based. So whilst the statistics are important, it's probably more important as to get a, the feel, the public perception, because that's how you enhance public trust and confidence, to my mind. And that's me concluded this. The report's uh, in, in the pack, the full report. It's written in a, a rather, I think it's quite challenging to read the way, the way it's written, purely because uh, it was written to maximise accessibility. But it is, it is quite difficult to read. But, you know, Stevie and I will now take any, any questions you may have. OK, thank you, everybody, for the presentation that's been made. I'm going to ask now if anyone has any questions, uh, if you could indicate at this point. And I'll start to work my way through the hands that are appearing here. So could I come in the first instance to Richard Nelson? I thought Alec was first because he was trying to jump in before me, but he didn't make it. Um, thank you. And it's disappointing to hear the funding um, gap that you are probably going to have, the same as other services, NHS and as ourselves here as local um, elected services in, in South Lanarkshire. I suppose my question is round about um, legal highs and drug issues in South Lanarkshire and how that affects um, drug-induced psychosis. Because um, you'll probably find that most of that mental health issues that you probably visit is, is um, dealing with some of these legal highs that you can't control. And I, I suppose it's where are we putting those resources to? Is it the resources to the user or is it the resources to the people who are supplying the user? Because I think that's some of the biggest issues is, is we know who these people are. And you can't do anything until um, you have enough information to go and get them. Um, so I suppose that's where the difficulty is in some of our communities, is that they come to us and say, we know who it is, we tell you who it is, but you don't do anything. And I think that's where the difficulty is for us 
Uh, and the other question that was just about the 101 service and the, the time frame, and I appreciate your, your staffing issues that you have, um, but some of the issues that we get is the time frame that people are on the 101 calls, um, and I've known people who have sat on that 101 call for hours, um, and then they still don't even get a police officer to come and see them. And not necessarily always need a police officer to come and see you. I suppose that can be dealt with with a phone call as, as they change in police structure, as you've, you've just said a minute ago in your presentation. So, and I get that it's enhancing the service, but again, it's, it's a difficulty that we see in our local communities. Thank you, Chair. No, thanks very, thanks very much. Really, really important questions, really big topics there. So, so thank you for that. In the first sense, we, uh, we'll deal with the drugs element first. Our focus is on supply and production, those because they cause the greatest harm in the community. If you can cut it off as early upstream as is humanly possible, then you won't have possession, you won't have usage, and you won't have the impact that has on public health. You know, it, it is interesting because you spoke there about uh, the getting information to us. So we would, you, the information that would come in, we, ne we need to set up or reinvigorate the channels for that information coming in. You remember many years ago that all sort of public bodies in, in South Lancashire, and South Lancashire were at the forefront of this, had, you know, in those days it was a bit of paper, and you would write down anything you had and you would pass it to your local authority liaison officers uh, confidentially, whether, whether by email or whether just handing notes in when they were back, you know, when they were physically in the, in the buildings all the time. You would have that, that conduit to pass it in. We would then anonymise it. We would put it on the Scottish Intelligence Database, which, as the name suggests, goes across Scotland uh, with the details on it. And then that information, once we process it and analyse it, we determine whether it can be acted upon. And as I think you're alluding to, if for talking to it, you get a bunch of logs in from all different partners talking about a specific person or house in Hamilton, for talking sake, then we can act on that. But it does go back to building that confidence in people and in agencies to bring us that information uh, to allow us to act upon, because the impact of drugs, drug-related deaths, and indeed alcohol abuse is, is phenomenal, and it's such a strain across the public sector. The second part about your 101. So, Chief Constable was dead clear about the three things, despite all these cuts, the three things that must be protected are the call handling service, the 101 line, the uh, response policing, those that answer the calls, and public protection, those that deal with all the abhorrent crime from child abuse to rape to domestic abuse. Those are the three elements of Police Scotland that will be absolutely protected from any reduction. Everything else is, is up for grabs because, quite frankly, it's less important to the communities. 101 is, if we look at 999 first, our 999 you can look online and you'll see us on the table. We perform very well at 999 response times. 101 is, you know, I've only ever had to phone it once. I had to wait for 15, 20 minutes. But it is a non-emergency line and it is a call, it is a call centre. But what, you've, what people probably don't know in the background is for talking to I heard a story recently about a, a 101 call. It took two hours because the person on the other end of that phone couldn't communicate as members in this room can. They were tapping on the phone, so they needed assistance. So that call handler done an outstanding job, two hours to get an emergency response, and from that worked out where the person was, what the nature of the distress was. But of course, that two-hour call, that individual maybe could have dealt with 10, 12 calls. So it's circumstances like that that are maybe delaying, that adds a few minutes on to all those other calls. But yeah, so... You know, Stevie might have uh, additional information to add to that purely because he, he went down and visited them because we're very interested in, in that as well. Thanks, Chair. If you don't mind, just very briefly, I actually visited the call centre last week and I've got active engagement with my peer within that business area. Uh, I think having done that, I've got a better understanding myself for the challenges that they face with staff retention, staff training and staff turnover. But what I've also got a better understanding of is the data that suggests that actually they're doing pretty well. <laughs> in terms of Terminal 9 call handling, they answer them very quickly. But in terms of 101 handling, they also answer them very quickly. Most 101 calls are answered within 40 seconds. And that data is now available. But what we're also encouraging members of the public to do 
is to report things online using a, a pro forma that's available on their website. It gets you the same outcome. It goes to the same call centre. It gets you the same outcome, but it saves you waiting on the phone. What I would want to do, and maybe not for this committee, I would suggest, but in terms of the Safer South Lanarkshire Board, Chair by Councillor McLachlan, uh, I, I would quite happily get somebody from that business area within Police Scotland to produce the data and deliver a presentation that would maybe give the council members a bit more confidence in relation to the quality of that service. OK, um, I'm going to come to Alec Allison now. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, it's certainly very good and interesting to hear. And I don't think many of us would realise just how much uh, of the work you do is, in your own words, I think you said, unseen, whether it be behind closed doors or behind a mouse. Um, and I think we do have to realise that. But a couple of things from your presentation. Um, local communities vary greatly between North and South Lanarkshire, never mind rural and urban. But I don't see a great deal of difference as to how you'd maybe be looking at dealing with those differences within your plan. Um, on page 43, you're talking about the needs of local communities. One of the things that in the rural area that I cover um, is seeing the police having a, having a visual presence, which we've really lost over the last few years. Um, and even the nearest bit to a, a police station now will be many miles away. Um, sorry, just for clarity, I, in Clydesdale East, which is half of South Lanarkshire, um, in geographical terms. Uh, and that, in their constituents is very important because that lack of visibility um, leads to perhaps more concerns as to what's happening um, and a belief that they won't be as well protected, another of your strategic um, out, out, outcomes. And that also leads those who are maybe on the edge, if, if you like, of thinking it's far safer to behave in non-legal activity, if you like. I understand the constraints you've got within there, but uh, is there nothing within this that can be done to address these particular issues? Um, because they have been ongoing for some time and, in many people's views, aren't really being addressed. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor, for your question. Uh, I agree. Uh, I think we need to work harder to make that visible presence felt within the communities. Uh, and I think it's incumbent on me as the divisional commander to make sure that that takes place. That isn't easy. And I'll give you an example. So uh, this morning I have eight constables staffing the counters of police stations. I've got a bit of a binary choice. Do we close the station and get them to patrol the community? Or do we get them to sit behind a desk and not speak to anybody for the eight hours of their shift because not many people come in to speak to them nowadays? So that's just today. There are eight constables, most of whom are in South Lanarkshire, sitting in a police building at the minute, waiting for members of the public to come in and speak to them. I need to make some difficult choices around what our priorities are collectively to get that balance right between public accessibility but public visibility. But, but I would hope we're getting there. I mean, we, there is a significant investment through the council and the quad bikes that are used by our community officers. Uh, I was personally in Lanarkshire on Monday for the opening of the Clydesdale Housing Association Community Hub. Uh, and, and there is a lot of good policing activity happening within the community. I think we need to get better at informing yourselves and informing the communities of what that actually looks like on a daily basis. Uh, and I think I would give that commitment that we need to work with yourselves to get that better understanding how that visibility can be increased. OK, uh, can I come now to Margaret Walker? Thanks, Chair. Um, I would just like to acknowledge um, the, the great partnership work that the community police do with the uh, Whitlaw Burn 
um, stakeholders group. Um, they have been very involved there ac across a range of issues and they always respond um, when we have issues uh, and we want um, the police to maybe attend one of the meetings um, um, and contribute and listen um, to people's concerns about various things. And the, there's been a lot of good work around diversion activities uh, with young people in uh, the Whitlaburn um, sort of Spring Hall area. And, and you can't sort of overestimate um, how positive that is in terms of, you know, building trust and, and relationships uh, with the, the community. Um, and I know, obviously, the police as well um, have been available for, you know, Campus Lang uh, Community Council when they have had um, various issues, which tend to be different issues, and there's a whole um, plethora of different things. Um, so I would just, just like to acknowledge that. But obviously, um, like yourself, ex expressing concern about capacity and, and the, abil the ability you know, to you know, continue to do that. I know that um, the good work that, that was been done by the, the campus police, um, particularly Cathkin High School, um, it, it is now under threat, and because of capacity, you may not be able to you know, provide that service. So, um, I mean, the answer, you know, obviously, it is overall the financially challenging climate um, and how we as you know, elected members can be useful in terms of um, highlighting that uh, and lobbying for more resources as we do, you know, continuously um, through COSLA uh, uh, and other uh, mechanisms. So I just wanted to say, you know, acknowledge that, but also say to you, we are aware um, of the pressures as well. I mean, one of the, the issues that came up um, that was kind of resultant of the the issues in the NHS around ambulance waiting times, etc., um, is how you know police time can be tied up. If there's, if there's an accident, there's somebody lying in the, the street, there's no ambulance for three hours. All of that has an impact. So it's all linked um, around to what's happening in, in the, the NHS and the, the difficulties there around you know ambulances and workforce and all of that. So that's why we really appreciate you know the partnership working across community planning to, you know, maybe look at, you know, how we resolve some of these issues. So it was just to acknowledge and, and thank you for the, the work that you've done in, within uh, my local communities. Right. Just by way of reply, well, th thank you very much. I'll certainly pass that on to the, to the local community team there, Kevin Miller and his team, for, for some really great work, clearly, that, that they're doing in, in terms of their accessibility. You know, you brought up an, an excellent point there. Uh, both education and health. We've got excellent relationships with both education and health, and that's really important. Uh, you know, we'll speak at that, no doubt about campus officers. You know, we've had to reduce by two. Initially, that was that was down to finances, but actually, there's a much wider issue, and it's to do with there's more people leaving the police than we can recruit. We could we could have recruit two thousand people want to join the police, but as an educational establishment, Scottish Police College has a capacity. So even when it's full, it's difficult to, to fill, to, to plug that gap, to keep the number. So actually the, the conversation's moved on, and now two of the, there's two officers to cover four schools uh, between Calderside and Hamilton Grammar, and then of course Stonelaw and Trinity. Uh, and that's, you know, that's commensurate with, with you know, North Lancashire have a, a similar relationship in, in some schools, and across Scotland. You know, the vast bulk of schools don't have a campus officer. Uh, and in terms of health, you know, you, you brought up a good point about the ambulance. We, we were always the service of last resort, but now increasingly we're the service of first resort because as people get frustrated that for the huge stresses and strains that are on our, our excellent NHS colleagues and ambulance service colleagues, if they can't get an ambulance, the next port of call, and I've never really understood this, it jumps to police who are the least medically trained of all the emergency services. Uh, but we find ourselves the other day, we, uh, we had two cops sitting at Wishaw Hospital for 16 hours with someone. That's two cops that can't be at, you know, they can't be in Clydesdale doing that, that piece of work. They can't be at the Whitleyburn community group and so on. They can't investigate the ongoing crime, take those calls and so on because they're tied up. And then a couple of months ago, we had every single car that was due to patrol Hamilton and Wishaw and Motherwell were all sitting outside Wishaw General Hospital with individuals who were in crisis. And this isn't any criticism at all, but it just highlights that the impact on one part of the public sector uh, to another, we're all interlinked. Hey, thanks, folks. I've got three more questions, and I'm going to um, 
just given sort of time constraints, just ask people to be as, as brief as possible. Um, come to Maureen Chalmers first. Um, thanks, Chair, and thanks everyone for your presentation. Um, we bit of transparency here. Um, I've got a national causal role on police uh, scrutiny and performance. So, um, a couple of weeks ago, we had a presentation on some research around about what you know, people's expectations of police and, and the high levels of trust. But interestingly, one of the things that folk were saying was police should not be dealing with folk with mental health um, concerns or very vulnerable people that are experiencing a mental health episodes. I know we had a few years ago the distress brief intervention model and that was quite successful but I'm wondering how that's going and whether there's anything else we can build into what we're doing in, in your delivery plan locally that would help take that pressure because although folk think you shouldn't be doing it, it is realistically what you are doing. Thanks. No, that's an excellent point. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll come to the, the last bit first. So I've got responsibility for the, the, the DBI and the Community Triage Service, and it's expanding through great work with NHS colleagues. It, it, rather than situations, we've got, we've got to recognise, we, we have to be realistic whilst we can't pull the shutters down on mental health in terms of a police response. I note that in England and Wales, we have Humberside have basically done that and said, we will, we will not deal with it anymore at all. And then the Met, uh, the Commissioner of the Met was on recently saying they are looking at a similar approach, such as the stresses and strains it's putting on. But, but equally, in our plan, you'll see we've got things like protecting our most vulnerable. That, for me, is, you know, we, we've got to lend a hand. We shouldn't be the lead agency, same as drug-related deaths. That's, that's not, we are not the lead agency for either of those, but we're active contributors uh, in terms of the response. So I think the DBI has now been extended. We're looking at, it's on the cusp of going to over 16s, so rather than over 18s. And in terms of police time, we know that the records for those in mental health distress, we can take them to Douglas Street or another facility and get people dealt with more quickly than taking them and putting additional burden on A&E. So where at all possible, we want to develop them to the most appropriate uh, resource. Uh, the other thing you spoke about there was about you know the work you're doing with COSLA. And I know that an invitation's gone out. I don't know how widely it's gone out. It's certainly gone out to... Uh, the Safer South Lancashire board members to attend sessions that will maybe see the wider element of Police Scotland for regional and national assets about when we put when we put the drones up or we have public order or firearms or, or search capabilities for high risk missing people uh, of which we've got a tremendous amount, particularly children in, uh, in Lanarkshire and you see what those assets bring and they, they can only exist because it's a national service Thank you Thanks. Thank you very much uh, could I, could I come to Morizak? Thank you. <clears throat> the, well, I thank the police for the, the service they do. They go over and above um, what's, what's expected of them, especially when it's a job that's a high risk of um, injury and death. The underfunding of the police is a concern for me because with a cut in the number of officers that have left, there's a loss of experience. That's happening as well. So there's a there's a drain in the experience. We've got newer officers with not enough experience coming through, and that takes time for that to build up. I mean, your <coughs> presentation you gave me um, gave us sorry. Uh, in the previous one, hate crime was mentioned in it, and in this one, um, hate crime's not mentioned in it. The thing is that now that the first minister Hamza Yusuf's been um, uh, been put into office, the amount of um, comments that have uh, been made have spiked of, uh, of a nasty nature. And I think that maybe there may be, be concerns there with that, with that happening. Um, our public services, uh, whenever one gets when there's an impact on one NHS, for instance, you were, you were speaking about, it does affect the others, um, such as bed blocking, then the officers are, because I was in the hospital last year, an A&E, &E, and I noticed the number of police officers that were coming back, back and forth, and the amount of time it took. So then that would mean that if there's a call, then there'll be delays in the call because the officers are in the hospital. So I think I think there seems to be a bigger picture that you know we need we need more public funding more than anything else, so that we can try and streamline a lot more. The final one is a question with the, uh, the police local plan. Will this mean that there'll be any uh, station closures 
and also uh, community policing. Will this impact on community policing? Hi, Councillor. It's good to see you. Uh, the, the piece about hate crime is almost unwitting text within here. Hate crime will always be a priority. But what's, what's important in this one is hate crime falls into both two of those priorities, at least online safety, as you alluded to with the, the new First Minister, and antisocial behaviour. So it, it is covered in that sense. It might not be as explicit because it's a strategic plan uh, with, with only you know, 10 criminal elements to it, um, preventative elements. But trust me, when we're talking about, you know, I was at a, a Ramadan event last night in, in Lanarkshire Mosque, talking of Iftar there, talk, talking extensively and doing an address to, the, to everyone that had attended. Uh, and we were talking about, about hate crime and about that need, that having that confidence to come forward. We will take it incredibly seriously. Uh, irrespective of your particular protected characteristic, if anybody reports a hate crime, trust me, it's, it's dealt with on a par of the likes of domestic abuse. It, it really is. Your second point about estates, uh, we have got a, a hugely ambitious plan about our estate. Our capital budget with, within our budget, as I said earlier, six out of every seven pounds, police officers only. Our buildings are not far off falling apart. And you know, the deputy chief officer gave evidence at Scottish Parliament a few months ago to say the budget settlement is such that if he knows a building is falling down, he can't do anything about that. He has to wait for it to fall down and then effect repair because there isn't a preventative element to it. So our buildings are not in good condition. Although, you know, commander next to me went to, went to Lanark yesterday, just being refurbished, great. I know I've got meet, meetings with states every week about the condition of our present buildings and what we want to do. Will that mean less police stations? Yeah, because we can't continue to operate the way we're doing. I would far rather have reduced police stations that are better for the public and the officers than a lot of police stations, which are, like Kerluk, uninhabitable. We have to make those difficult choices uh, in that respect. I don't know if you want to... Thanks, Andy. The only thing I would add to that is uh, we are having active discussions with the Chief Executive and others within the Council about any opportunities that might exist for co-location and, and close partnership working so that we're in the heart of the community together. Will you like to come back? Well. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll be very, very quick. I was going to say, ask, ask that question that we have Q and A's in, in the council in several um, buildings in several towns. Um, would it not be a possibility of maybe sharing that and uh, doing joint work? If, if there is closure, then at least there's uh, a way for residents to come and raise concerns. In short, yes, that, that's it in a nutshell. If, if we can have, you know, as a councillor just said, you know, the community council uh, groups are really, really important and we try everything we can to get there, but having those, those other places where we can, we can drop in and just be available, because as, as we said right during this presentation, public trust and confidence is everything to policing as it is to the whole of the public sector. And it is about visibility, accessibility, having those conversations and you know, engaging with your communities and finding out what's really going on rather than reading Twitter. Uh, so I've got two more questions. I'm going to come to Gav Keat, who's joining us remotely in the first instance. Gav. Thank you very much, Chair. Are you able to hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Right, thanks a lot, and thank you very much to our police representatives this morning, particularly given the pressures that you're facing and the time that you've permitted us this morning, and for outlining your local policing plan. Trade unions have rightly highlighted that Police Scotland are facing £74 million of guts from the Scottish Government, and I think when you highlight mental health as one of the prime reasons for staff absence in Lanarkshire Policing Division, I think there's no doubt that there's a correlation between that given the workload pressures and the stress, there's no doubt 
going to come from the cuts. So I suppose my question comes down to the service itself and what mechanisms and scope you have in terms of supporting staff's well-being, mental health and physical, to get them back into our service where we need them to be. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, mental health is a challenge for police officers. As I said earlier on, I've done the role for 31 years. I've been exposed personally to more trauma than everybody else in this room, I would suggest, uh, because that just goes with the role of being a police officer, and different people deal with it in different ways. Uh, we are, as a local police division, but also as an organisation, trying to work hard to support colleagues. For example, we are currently investing in uh, wellbeing weekends. Uh, there is a recuperation centre at Octorada that police officers uh, have access to, which is normally open Monday to Friday. Within Lanarkshire, I've secured some additional funding to actually send some individual officers, but also some teams of officers, for counselling sessions and other activities over weekend periods. And just to give an example, there's a team based in Blantyre who deal with child sexual abuse every day. That team is under significant pressure. They're not visible to the public. They never patrol the streets in a uniform, but they deal with horrible traumatic <laughs> events every day they come to work. And they need a bit of extra support in terms of their mental health right now. So there are ongoing activities uh, within the division and elsewhere. And whilst our budgets are squeezed, the same as local authority, we definitely recognise that as individuals, we need to look after our police officer colleagues to make sure that they remain healthy and that they continue to deliver a service to the public, but also the things that they're exposed to don't affect their long-term well-being. And I'll maybe just ask Andy to add something that's, that he's leading on locally as well. Thanks very much. Uh, you, you'll notice, Councillor, if, if you look at the plan, on the, bo the bottom strand, the foundation strand, you'll see workforce wellbeing is the central point because we see that as the absolute cornerstone of delivery of absolutely everything else. But one thing we are doing as well, so we've recognised that the amount of trauma police officers see because very rarely do you have a police officer attend an incident because somebody's disclosing their exam results to you. You know, it is invariably bad news. So that takes its toll, whether it's a big event and you're really stressed about that, or it's that drip drip effect over a period of time. I was talking to somebody as recently as about two weeks ago who burst into tears, and it was to do with an incident they had attended 15 years ago that he then disclosed he relives on his way to work pretty much every day. That's the sort of thing that police officers face, much the same as perhaps ambulance crew, health colleagues, uh, other organisations, fire service and, and so on. It is really acute in, in policing, and it is something we've, we've really got to think about. So that got us thinking about, you know, it's been bubbling away with things about post-traumatic stress disorder and uh, aligned uh, mental health issues. So what we've done is tie up with a, a charity that, that helps the military, because the parallels actually are, are really, really similar uh, in a bizarre way. So this charity is Who Cares Wins, um, and what they do, and I know they've worked, done a little bit of work with South Lancashire Council, which is great, and they're coming in and speaking to not only just our frontline staff and giving them that opportunity, and there are police officers that work with that charity, retired police officers, giving them the opportunity to speak and disclose things to them in private and then put them towards the most effective referral service. But there is a little sense of camaraderie about that shared experience uh, that, you know, it is worth its weight in gold. And... What they've also been doing, and this is really important as well, and sometimes we we don't knowingly forget about it, how could you? But I've actually got concerns about the various supervisory and management structures within policing and their mental health, because the stresses and strains and hours of work that certainly my peers and chief inspectors, Stevie's peers and others, because you're in, you're, you are always first in the door. You are always last out the door. You are always worrying about what decisions you've made on a real, real basis. You know, yesterday I uh, was dealing with a, a firearms thing, and all, I made the decision that it didn't require firearm support to go and search two houses, not in Lanarkshire, because I'm dealing with stuff that's that's in other areas. And I made the decision 
me alone made the decision that it didn't meet the threshold for sending full firearms response into those houses. All night I'm thinking about that, and I was delighted this morning, 10 minutes before this meeting, to say we've been in, safely done, persons arrested, no threat posed. And the weight off your shoulders at that point is phenomenal, and we've got that at every level in supervisory elements of policing. And it's really important we don't just think about segmented elements of policing, we have to see it as a holistic approach. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have one final question now from Dave McLachlan. Davey. Thank you, Chair. It's, it's not a question, actually. Um, um, uh, it's a thank you, in fact, to these two gentlemen sitting in front. I've recently taken over as a Chair of Safe for South Lanarkshire Board, as you know, and at the start of that, Stevie Dolan asked for a meeting with me. We spent a good couple of hours. Um, he was really keen that we did meet to discuss um, just what our relationship was going to be like, any issues that we'd like to raise. So I was very, very impressed by that. Um, and Andy sitting next to him, the, the, both of these gentlemen, I can't believe the commitment they've got. And if there's any doubt, I don't think they will be, given what's, uh, given what's been uh, presented to us this morning, this morning. So it's my sincere thanks to the both of you and, and everyone in the force who are doing a fantastic job. Now, it was mentioned earlier, um, I think it's Stevie, Stevie that mentioned that there's a there's an event taking place, and I've circulated this to the board members because I was asked to do so. It came from the, uh, Deputy Chief Constable Malcolm Graham, and it's asked me to send this to all board members, which I have done. But I think it would be pertinent to... Carol Lyons dealing with it at the moment, um, uh, and I think it might be pertinent. And with your indulgence, the guy sitting in front of me, if we make that invitation open to all the council members. Now, there's three events taking place. One on the 3rd, one on the 11th, and one on the 24th. And the region of the West event is on the 11th. I've already uh, agreed that I'm going to attend to that one. So with your indulgence, Chair, uh, perhaps Carol Lyon could send that invitation to all council members if they wanted to attend, because I'm sure it's going to be beneficial and very informative to everyone. So that, that's all I wanted to say, Chair. Thanks very much. OK, I think I see some nods of agreement on, on that final point. So can I... Um, Really, just to put it, that is a very extensive session, and I think um, it went on for longer than I'd anticipated. But I just want to, um, I think it was very worthwhile, and I just want to put on record my appreciation for our colleagues from Police Scotland for speaking to their plan and for their candour. And I think there are some common themes coming out of, out of that about those multi agency issues, about the interplay between what happens in one part of the public sector and the demands on another. And um, I think that key point that I keep coming back to is that the less than 20% or just about 20% of the cases that you're dealing with or your workload is about pure criminality. I think that is, I think once we have really kind of understood that and crystallised that in our own minds, the, the, the police plan that you've set out um, takes on a new context, really. So, listen, can I thank everybody um, for their contributions to date? Can I ask that we agree the recommendations in the report? Are we agreed? Yeah. We're agreed. Um, Thank you very much for, for your attendance today. Thank you. Um, we have one more item of business, but I am conscious of the time. And if the committee is so minded, I was going to just pause for a short comfort break at this, at this point and maybe reconvene in just under 10 minutes, if that's OK with people. OK, thank you.
could take your seats, please, people. Okay, thank you very much. I'm just going to uh, restart the meeting now. Do you need to? No. Okay, I'm ready just to get right into our next item of business, which is agenda item seven on the Community Alert Alarm Service. Um, and can I come to Suman Sengupta to speak to this item? Suman. Thank you. Good morning. Members in this chamber and online will have heard me speak on many occasions over the last year about the unprecedented challenges facing social care as we seek to balance changing demand, rising costs, workforce supply and financial pressures. Audit Scotland has stated clearly that recurring savings and delivering services differently are essential if we are to ensure the sustainability of vital social care provision, especially for those with the greatest needs and greatest vulnerabilities. Now, all integration joint boards, just as is the case for all councils, have a statutory obligation to set a balanced budget. The South Lanarkshire Integration Joint Board met yesterday, which it considered action required to be taken in 23-24 to address a recurring funding gap for adult and older people's social care of £8.9 million. The Integration Joint Board acknowledged the importance of the supportive arrangements in place with both South Lanarkshire Council and indeed also NHS Lanarkshire, as it has and will have to contend with what are and will be unavoidably difficult decisions. In setting its budget yesterday, the Integration Joint Board considered the potential contribution then that a reduction in the subsidy and thereby an increase in the charge for the Community Alert Service could contribute. The Integration Joint Board recognised that decisions and charging levels are a matter for the Council, hence the report before the Executive Committee here today. In speaking to the report then, as per Section 4, the South Lanarkshire Community Alert Alarm Service is a service provided on request. Its provision is not based on assessed need or on eligibility criteria. Section 4 highlights the current and projected increased cost of the service, the latter due to necessary digital upgrades and inflation. The current cost of the alarm service is £3.7 million, and that is projected to increase to £4.4 million in the coming financial year. This means the cost will increase by almost 20%. The current weekly charge then, as members can see from the report, is £1.70 per week. As members will recognise, this represents a current level of subsidy of 86% to service users. If the charge remains at that level, given the increased cost, the level of subsidy in effect would increase to 89%. And considering the potential contribution then of a change to charging rate to contribute to social care pressures, the Integration Joint Board has reviewed comparative data from across Scotland. The levels charged amongst the local government benchmarking family that South Lanarkshire Council belongs to are set out in 4.6. As members will see, the level of charging in South Lanarkshire is the lowest. Section 4.11 then sets out the options the Integration Joint Board considered yesterday. Following this discussion then, the Integration Joint Board agreed to make a request to today's Executive Committee. And that request was for South Lanarkshire Council to consider reducing the subsidy to 74% and so increase weekly charging to £4.10. This would place South Lanarkshire in the median of its local, game, local benchmarking family, plus absorb the costs of inflation. If a decision is made by the Executive Committee to increase a level of charging today, Section 5 sets out the action will be taken to support any service users with concerns at the best that we can. As 4.14 sets out, if all or part of the money that were generated from that increase in charging, which would, the IGB would hope to be £0.7 million, is not recoverable, the Integration Joint Board will require to identify alternative options early in quarter one. These would likely involve a reduction in social care delivery. Decisions such as this are not presented lightly. They require to be approached with the utmost seriousness, as I know the Executive Committee here would approach them. The reality is that there will be much harder decisions for those of us responsible for social care over the coming months and years ahead. I would then refer members back to the recommendations in Section 2. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Suman. Can I ask at this point if there are any questions to Suman about his report? Uh, 
And if you could indicate so now, and I'll come to Hugh MacDonald. Thanks, Chair. First of all, can I put on record my thanks to Ian Beattie, who I met with recently and who was able to answer quite a number of questions that I had. I still have a number of questions, though, for committee, if you'll indulge me, Chair. So, firstly, the South Lanarkshire Health and Social Care Partnership Strategic Commissioning Plan approved last year, which was based extensively on community consultation and engagement, set out as its priority number one, sustaining statutory social care and core health care functions. So, given this, if we do not accept the request to increase the weekly charge to £4.10, raising the £700,000, what will the potential impact on other social care services be, particularly in respect of meeting our statutory requirements and responsibilities? Did you have any other questions? Or was that... I've got another few questions, but I'd like to take the first couple individually, and then I can group the last three, if that's acceptable. Right, OK. Well, I assume to respond to that one. I'll come back to you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, in terms of the approach set out at yesterday's Integration Joint Board, which, for the benefit of all members, is now available within the public domain, uh, the Integration Joint Board agreed a uh, sustainability and value option appraisal screening scale. And what that then highlights are the areas where we would absolutely avoid taking forward proposals for uh, ad adjustments to the budget to those areas where actually we feel there will be scope for making adjustments with minimal impact on individuals. All of those, us involved in this process absolutely understand that the nature of what social grid is, the nature of what we're involved in, means that any adjustment to our budget, frankly, will have an impact on somebody. That's just the nature of what we do. And I appreciate the fact that all members here know that. Uh, what we have set out, and this very much resonates with what our Police Scotland colleagues have talked about already, is that public protection and clinical safety will be our number one priority for protection closely followed by professional registration requirements. So those are areas that we would absolutely see from an officer's perspective, certainly, and the Integration Joint Board have confirmed would be not the areas we would go to. What that then means, though, is everything else has to be reviewed when it comes to working at how we can operate within the resources available to us. Um, at this stage, then, the Integration Joint Board has actioned officers involved to progress a process of identifying a range of options in line with that value a sustainability and option appraisal screening scale to bring back recurrent savings requirements um, over the course of the coming months ahead. Uh, so it would be premature for me to provide any more detail than that at this place, not least because we need to engage properly with all the appropriate stakeholders, including our trade unions and others, and bring back detailed costed suggestions. But as I said, we are quite clear, something from an officer and the board perspective, that of the need to protect public protection, clinical safety, and the professional registry requirements of our services. But as I said, that then means that everything else has to be responsibly on the table. Thanks. Given, given you just said, human and, and human, assuming, sorry, and given that the IJB are relying heavily, I suppose, on uncommitted reserves and savings from unfilled vacancies to go some way to meet that shortfall in this financial year, what is the financial strategy to meet ongoing funding requirements in future years? Will this have implications for our in-house services? I'm particularly considering about whether or not we would need to outsource some of the services, such as care at home or other social services, to reduce those costings. So I'm conscious that this is probably a discussion for another day, rather given the information that's been presented to members in front of you at this point. As I said, the Integration Joint Board has now empowered uh, officers to go away and do that detailed work. It would be, this would be too early for me to kind of give a view on any of that work. You would, because if I was to start kind of suggesting things, you would quite legitimately come back to me with questions about costings, who we'd engaged with, had we worked through the implications for different particular groups here. So we're, we're in the early foothills of that work, but certainly when we come down to presenting those options in front of the Integration Joint Board and then sharing those with other partner organisations and key individuals such as yourself, we will have all that information laid out. I find it a wee bit difficult to sort of pull that together in terms of what we're being asked to agree to today when we don't actually know what the full implications of making that decision might be at this stage. So, 
you know, that, that does concern me a little bit in terms of how we're going to come to that decision. So if I could maybe leave that with you and maybe come back to me when, with some other responses, that would be good. So in terms of just the other questions that I had, if you're happy for me to group them together, Chair, then I'll just do that. If I could get my mouse to work on the laptop, that would be even better, because I could actually see what I've written down. So we'll try and get that done. So in, in terms of the current system, we know that that's based on requests rather than assessed need. So how will we continue to meet the need of those in the high-risk categories? Is there a potential option for those who have a community care assessment that has them in the substantial or critical need bracket to have the option of utilising self-directed support as a means of funding the cost to ensure that this service can be supported? And in terms of consultation, what proposals do we have to consult, inform and assess need? And have we encountered any issues at this point in terms of people who have transitioned to digital? Have we had any connectivity issues or are there any thoughts around providing like, broadband services that are fit for purpose? I'm thinking particularly in the rural areas where connectivity might not be particularly good. And the last question, Chair, is around capital funding. We're using quite a bit of capital funding to support this if we agree it in the initial stages. It's a, a system which I think will probably evolve over time and require a level of upgrade as we go because digital technology moves on just like your mobile phone needs changed every few years. I'm su supposing that there might need to be changes in this. So what have we done to prepare for that in terms of being able to f fund that, I suppose, in coming years? Thank you. Uh, so answer some of those questions, then Ian Beattie's here today, so he can answer some of the specifics. Uh, in terms of the overall approach to the service and set up, what we're here today is to present the request from the Integration Joint Board in regards to the charging regime. So at this point, there is no request or suggestion about a redesign of the service. Certainly, that is something that could be considered by the Integration Joint Board going forward. And as the report highlights, there are a variation in how these services are provided and the model of service across Scotland. So certainly there's a lot of, I would suggest, benefit for doing that. And I think your point is well made in that regard. I shall let Ian come in in a second in respect to this, the question about self-directed support. In terms of the points about consultation um, and engagement through the digitalisation process, again, members here will recall the updates that have been provided in terms of the analogue to digital investment that's gone on, how that's gone relatively smoothly across the piece. There have been certain challenges that we've encountered. I have to say it's not been down to the Council. That's to do with some of our external partners, but we work very efficiently to address them. Again, Ian can speak to some of the work that we're doing in terms of improving connectivity in that regard. The key aspect of that, though, is that we don't have the option as a provider of community alert services, we don't have an option but to digitise because of the overall approach that's been taken in terms of telecoms across the country. And again, in terms of your capital system, it's absolutely a legitimate point about ongoing costs. One of the reasons that the Integration Joint Board has had to look at this area is because of the ongoing revenue consequences of digitisation. So over and above the very welcome capital investment that the Council has made, as a requirement to keep up the system, it, there is a, an ongoing revenue requirement that has flowed from that, which is a, a further reason why the increased costs uh, are having to be considered here. Uh, in terms of what that might lead, look like going forward, there is nothing quantified at this point, so we're not anticipating one. But again, I think your speculation in that regard is entirely sensible. What I would do is come back down to the fact that actually we have a significant recurring funding deficit to address. We do have a plan, and the IGB has agreed a balanced budget, and Audit Scotland have confirmed that it, would, it, it fulfills the criteria for being a balanced budget for the coming financial year. But both Audit Scotland and the Integration Joint Board, and indeed I, am very clear that that buys us time. It is a similar approach to that that the Council has adopted in terms of setting its budget for this year, where it has taken a combination of uh, recurrence changes as well as use of reserves to buy time, to buy members in this room time, to do the more detailed work in a similar vein to what you set out. But I'll hand it over to Ian to answer, answer additional details. Okay, thanks, Simon. So, so in terms of the, of, of the work that's been ongoing, we've, we've had a, a kind of project team on, on the go for 
um, two or three years now, so working across um, social work resources, the call, the call handling team and um, IT um, to, 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 to address the kind of digital challenge. So that's uh, proceeding um, fairly well. So we're, we're working um, in a sort of partnership across Scotland in terms of uh, a tender for the Alarm Receiving Centre, which will be the, the core hardware where, the, where all the calls come into. Um, we're progressing quite rapidly with a rollout of, of new digital technology. So we're replacing some of the analogue um, boxes in people's homes with new kind of digitally com com compliant models. So I think we're up to about you know, roughly 3,000 of those being rolled out, and I think it's about 400 per month that we're, we're pushing out. Um, meantime, and we've done a bit of consolidation around our our kind of um, responder team as well to kind of optimise the, the, the efficiency of, 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 of the service there. So we're, we're kind of well on track in terms of meeting the kind of timeline around the analog to, to digital kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of switch over. Um, obviously, you've, you've picked up on just you know the the, 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 the the pace of change around technology. So the council has invested capital in, into to replacing all all the handsets. It's a fairly kind of you know immature kind of, kind of market around uh, that kind of, kind of set, set of equipment. So, um, but we'll I suppose just to keep a watching brief on how that evolves in terms of you know the um, you know, lifespans of equipment and, and replacement cycles. So that's obviously one of the things we've, we've, we've cited on. We'll, 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 we'll um, uh, give, give, give some consideration to going forward. Um, yeah, so comments around uh, you know the. The, the different cohorts of the population. So I think that you, you, you can be picked up that we've got a, a, a broad spectrum of people who um, engage um, and um, use community alarm services. So we've got folks who have got um, maybe higher levels of frailty and clearly we were, our assessment is determining that there's opportunities using kind of telecare, telehealth solutions to support them effectively. So we'd always really want to be promoting that and, and encouraging that. On the other end of the spectrum, we've got people who recognise their ageing, they're concerned about perhaps having a fall um, and they're using that as a kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of safety netting ex exercise. You know. So there may be opportunities in terms of looking forward to do some you know, redesign work around around the alarm um, um, options just to kind of you know, make sure we're offering the best offer to the different kind of cohorts of the population. So that may be the, the kind of work we'll take forward over the next few months. Okay, there are some other contributions. Now, can I come to Margaret Walker? Thanks, Chair. We have an amendment to this paper. I don't know what order you want. Did you want to take the amendment just now? I'm not sure if it's been circulated or... Uh, not yet. If you have a question, I would take a question now. Um, and otherwise, I'll ask for the amendment to be circulated while, while the, either we go to the next speaker or come back to you. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, so could we... Ask the Labour Group amendment be circulated, and I'll come to Alec Allison in the meantime. Alec. Thanks, Joe. Um, sorry, I couldn't quite hear Suman at the start. Did you say that the, that it wasn't possible to means test this um, payment, or can we? Is it something that's been considered? If we can, first of all, get an answer to that, please. Does either Suman or Ian want to pick that up? Ian? Yeah, so the, 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 we, don't, we don't means test the, 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 the payment at the moment. And I suppose one of the issues with that would be you know, creating an infrastructure to, to take that, that on. So there would be really kind of, kind of costs and, and delays uh, potentially if we were, to, if we were to introduce that that model. Um, I think one of, one of the, the, the elements we might want to consider going forward um, is whether this is, a, is a, a service you access through assessment as opposed to kind of just you know self-selecting and, um, and, and asking to be put, put on, on the system. So I think it would be useful for us to consider um, in a measured way just, just, just what are the options for, for the Council in terms of delivering this, this service going forward because there are, there are different strands we could, we, we could consider um, in terms of future delivery models. Uh, thanks, Ian. The reason I was asking that is looking at Item 46, page 67. We are uh, significantly less than the next cheapest, if you like, council for providing this, this service, and we seem to have been a bit detached, if you like. But it is always a fear that if you increase that significantly, it's going to be the, um, those who can least um, afford it that are going to be hit hardest. And I do think it's wrong that we're out that we're an outlier in that way, but I wouldn't like to see us at the top of that page either. Um, and it's how we can balance the two of these out and to make sure that any changes we do make um, 
aren't coming as a cliff edge and, and how we can maybe work, work that coming forward. The other thing is, again, it's what we actually mean by uh, changing the service. I think I'd be nervous if we were going to move away from a requested service to, ident to just identifying specific groups or uh, types or types of service. Um, I think it is important that we do try and keep the service being generally open um, to requests. Thanks. Okay, Suman, would you like to take that and then I'll come to Kirsten Rob. Suman. Thank you. Uh, just to provide clarity again in terms of what we're presenting here today. So this is, the, again, this is just bringing forward the request from the Integration Joint Board about the, the charging levels. There's, as both myself and Ian have said, this may well be something that we look at and put forward as a proposal uh, to the Integration Joint Board alongside the, the other work that will need to be done in terms of future models of service and delivery as part of the overall programme for occurring savings. But at, the, at this point, we, certainly this paper doesn't propose anything from the Integration Joint Board to change the service model at this point. OK, I'm going to come to Kirsten Robb and then I'll ask Margaret Walker to return to her amendment. Kirsten. Thank you. Uh, can I ask if uh, any assessments have been made of different models of the service and the cost to these? It would just be a wee bit concerning to approve an, a significant increase, but then the service could potentially change in the future. Suman. So, uh, thank you. Good morning. Uh, as I said, we've done benchmarking work around what's in place across Scotland. Uh, there are a variety of different models that play around. In fairness, one of the issues at the moment is everybody is looking at this issue. So uh, both the Integration Joint Boards and also councils right across Scotland are having a very similar conversation at the moment in terms of what level of charging should be and actually what the nature of the model is. So it's a bit of a fluid situation. Uh, as I said, the information here in terms of charging sets out the local government benchmarking family. I have all the numbers for across Scotland in front of me. So, for example, uh, the highest charge is currently levied by NHS, so not NHS, by Highland Council, which is £6.65 uh, a week. So there's a range of costs at play here. Um, and people approach this in slightly different ways. Again, we can probably uh, we'd be happy to sit down with you to take you through that. A challenge for all councils in terms of looking at this, though, is that it's very much a movable feast. So this is all going to change over the course of the next year because all uh, we've been good, as Ian said, in terms of the analog to digital switchover. We've been ahead of the curve on that, uh, and that's why we've made upfront investment and we're already able to identify the projected increase in costs that's going to flow from that. Uh, other councils are a bit further behind us, so they are going to be grappling with actually how they absorb those costs as well at this point. So um, the answer you might get from me today would be quite different than the answer you get from me in a, in a month from now. And I appreciate the frustrations with that. OK, can I come back to Margaret Walker now um, and ask Margaret to um, just speak to her amendment? And can I just check, Margaret, you'd be proposing that amendment. Have you got a, is there a seconder from? I've got a seconder as well, just for the record. OK, Margaret. I believe the amendment's now been circulated. Uh, we would like to move um, the following amendment. Um, we are obviously aware of the intense budget and service pressures on local government. However, we would like to suggest that the weekly charge for the community alarm service is to be approved at £2.20 and not the, the £4.10 that has um, originally been requested. Uh, we would also ask that the integration board um, related to but the last speaker was saying go back and consider uh, what would be possible in terms of redesigning the community alarm alert service to, to moderate future changes. We at the moment provide an enhanced model of services and in common with other authorities, as Suman has said, we, we are looking at how we um, deliver that. Um, community alarms are um, an essential component um, of care at home and prevention. Um, it's an essential in terms of the key objectives in the, the IGB's own strategic commissioning um, strategy, um, enabling as many people as possible to stay at home um, for as long as possible. Now, people have spoken that we do have a very favourable subsidy. I believe it is, it's 86%. However, um, 
the key issue is not um, the survey, it, it's the size of the impact, it's the impact of, of the hike that £4.10 um, would have on people. And it would likely affect most severely uh, the people who are most in need and who are, are, are most vulnerable. Um, they are the ones that in all likelihood, if it went up um, to that extent, would be more likely um, to pull out of the service. Um, and that then, I think, would have um, a very serious impact um, across a range of different things, particularly carers. Um, community alarms give carers peace of mind. Um, they know if anything happens, if there is any emergency, um, that the person they're caring for is going to get immediate help. Um, that will not be the case, obviously, and it would be more of a strain and more stress levels on carers, which is negative in terms of the impact that that will have um, on their mental health. So I would say um, it, it, it's going against the spirit of the Carers Scotland Act in terms of how we support carers. Um, it will also have an impact, I would say, on other aspects of the service, if, it's, if you have an accident, if you fall, if it's taking you longer to get attention, if your condition is, wor is worsening, if you already have complex needs, which is, is the case um, among the, the older cohort of people, particularly over 85s, then the situation is ultimately going to be worse and will in all likelihood end up um, in a, you know, pitching up A&E, a &E, emergency admissions, um, dominoes all down the line in terms of, you know, delayed discharge, whatever. So I would argue the impact on the service um, is going to be, you know, far more severe in terms of the, the benefit that you, you're getting um, in, in terms of the, the increase in the, the, the charge. So it's arguably um, not cost effective in that sense. It will in the end up, um, in the long run, um, will cost you more. So we would suggest that the IGB limit the charge to £2.20 um, because that is not the, the immediate height and it's not going to be the, the, the drastic hit for people, for certain uh, people that use the alarm, that the, the higher charge would be. Um, there's no point in investing in, as South Lan Lanarkshire has been doing, um, you're investing in, you know, care at home, multidisciplinary teams, delayed discharge teams in hospital, all of the investment that has gone into that to help to keep people in the community and then on the other hand, take the risk of substantial numbers of frail and vulnerable people, disabled people, actually coming out of the scheme um, and the resultant impact that that would have. Uh, we think it, it's, it's a negative move and in, in the long run would be detrimental um, and not help to achieve the aims of the IGB and the strategic outcomes they have within the, their commissioning plan. So I would ask um, elected members present to support the amendment um, and agree the amended paper. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Could I come to... Uh, yes, if I could come to Margaret Mary first. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, it was just one small point of clarification. Um, Councillor Walker referred to asking the IGIB to limit the charge. It was just to be clear that the amendment is asking the Executive Committee. It's the Executive Committee that's making the decision. Um, could I come to, back to Hugh MacDonald? Thanks, Chair. We would like to limit the the increase as much as we possibly can, but I do have some questions around this in terms of just the level of income that I, a, a £2.20 increase would actually generate and how we would meet the shortfall of meeting what is required in terms of the £700,000 to, I suppose, support the IGIB decision that was taken. And if we are looking at a £2.20 increase Again, going back to my first question, what will the impact be on other social care services if we are left with a fairly substantial, uh, I suppose, deficit in terms of what we are looking to try and raise in terms of revenue from going to the £4.10 pence charge? Do we know what the actual revenue would be from £2.20? Um, the quick answer to... To that, if I see Suman can come in, but I think the quick answer to the question 
um, is between £140,000 and £150,000 is what would be generated by the £2.20 uh, £2 charge. I've got, can I come to Suman just now and then I'm going to come to Jerry Condry. Suman. Um, thank you. So just, uh, well, I, I would, um, given this in a political debate, I'll just answer the technical question. So having just quickly calculated it, it would be a, a circa £150,000 would be generated by the proposed increase within the amendment. So that would mean a shortfall in, of £550,000. OK, and can I come... Sorry, sorry, Hugh, Hugh McDonald, do you want to come back on that one? Sorry, Hugh. Yep. So uh, the other part of the question was, if we've got £550,000 that we need to find to balance the budget, what are the proposals for us to be able to do that and what impact will that have on existing services? I think Suman has already dealt with that in his earlier... You, you asked the same question. Um, so Suman has already dealt with that. Can I come to Jerry? Uh, Right, hang, hang on a second. If you could wait till I've called your microphone. Can I... I'll come to the Chief Executive just now, but I think Suman Sengupta dealt with that earlier on. Cleland. Yeah, just to, to cover off the governance piece. So yesterday, the IGB agreed a balanced budget with a recommendation to Executive Committee. If Executive Committee agrees the amendment today, effectively that puts it into imbalance by the, 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 the balance of funding, the, the, the 550,000. Um, officers will need to then uh, go back to IGB and brief them. Um, firstly, the, the chair and vice chair um, of the decision today. It's likely that the chair and vice chair um, would agree uh, the need to call a, a special meeting of the IGB um, so that it can reflect on this decision and to ask officers to bring forward um, alternative suggestions. So Simmons already said he doesn't know right now exactly what would come in front of IGB, but that would be the process um, if the decision is taken today. And uh, I would imagine that the IGB will be a decision for the chair and vice chair, but I would imagine that they would like to convene a special meeting pre-summer um, to, to consider that. Thanks. Can I come to I'll come back. I've got other hands now going up. Can I come back just now? So I'm going to take Jerry Convery and then I'll come back to the other hands that have come up. Jerry. Thanks, Chair. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I don't think just listening to some contributions from some of our colleagues that we're a million of miles apart here. Uh, and I think the most important part uh, of the amendment is uh, number seven that the committee asked the Integration Board to consider redesigning the community alarm system because. And Hugh makes a valid point. Uh, what other things we need to be cut? We don't know. So if we're no, we're no in charge of uh, the figures, and we don't know what's going to be the thing. But the argument's quite simple. We heard the report for the police earlier on. These are some of the most vulnerable people in society. Uh, and to take the jump that the IGIB are looking for in one fell swoop, it certainly goes against my principles and the principles of the Labour Party. Uh, and that's why we're, we're hoping that we get unanimous support. We're not asking for anything radical. We're asking for a moderate, moderate rise. We're asking for our officials, not the IGIB officials, South Lanarkshire Council social work officials, to go back, look at the system that's in place at the present time, look to see if we can improve it, and if we can improve it to save money, so it's no, uh, I don't think, an emotive uh, amendment. It's an amendment that's trying to cover everything uh, in these hard times that we all face. And we're going to face harder times as the years go on. So I, I would hope that the colleagues in the room would support the amendment uh, and let's go forward and come up with a solution that suits all parties. Thank you. There are a number of hands coming up just now, so I'm going to take them, and then I, I want to say something myself about this, to try and get a consensus in the room. Um, right, Hugh McDonald, sorry, Hugh, you're, you're up again, so can I come back to Hugh McDonald, sorry, before I take the others. Thanks, Chair. I just had one kind of follow-up question for, for Suman, really, in terms of the £4.10, which is the mean average. Uh, do we have any idea of the drop-off rate in other comparative local authorities from having a rate at that level. 
so that we could have some information in terms of how much impact and effect it might have on people if we were to raise to that level? Because as I said previously, we'd like to keep that rate as low as we possibly can. So I, I, it goes back to the uh, answer I gave to Councillor Rob earlier on. Because of the variation in what's provided here, that's not readily available in terms of the setup here. Um, if we, I, all I would say to uh, members, and again, this is a political decision, quite legitimate, quite rightly, uh, there are a range of charging levels which are accommodated across Scotland, and so people are paying different rates to get a service that meets their needs in different ways. Okay. Can I come to John Ross? Yes, thanks, for, thanks very much, Chair. Um, I'm looking at the amendment and I'm trying to understand uh, the administration's um, idea here in putting forward a 220 charge. I mean, it, there's very little increase there from what we actually have at the present time. And it goes nowhere to meeting where uh, the uh, IJ would, would like us to go. Uh, I agree with uh, uh, a lot of the amendment, especially the last part, uh, uh, looking at finding uh, a better model going forward. But I'm just wondering why. Uh, why not just leave it at 170 then? Uh, we're only increasing it to 220. It's not coming anywhere near what the IGB uh, want us to do. Why are we not just leaving it the way it is and then we'll look for a better model? Uh, and then we go forward and look at how we can go forward in the future. I just don't understand. I can understand the administration's anxiety about putting increases on after the fiasco of the last couple of weeks, uh, but it's something that we really don't need to do if it's not going to meet anywhere near where the IGB wants us to go. That's, that's my own view on it. Can I... I'm, I'll speak for the administration at the end of the debate, but can I just... Um, to get, get through these questions to make sure that I'm taking everybody. Can I come to Moore's Act just now? Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> the 410 would be a 240% increase if, our, if my calculations are right. Um, I think that's far too high an amount um, for, a, for an increase. 220 seems a bit fairer and it's a bit more palatable for, for the members. I'm puzzled by, by John Ross's comment. There's one comment coming from the group that saying that, you know, we should increase it. And this general saying that we should um, keep it level, they can't seem to make up their minds themselves. They might be better off taking a break and having a discussion about it before they come up with comments like that. I'll consider that contribution part of the debate, and I'll move to Alec Allison. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Now that I've seen the paper, the one item I would like a little bit of clarification on is what you mean by uh, what you mean at point seven. Because as I said earlier, I do not think we should be changing the availability of the service, but if you're talking about the efficiency, the way we deal with it in that sense, and redesigning so that it's a better service without reducing the availability, then that is slightly different, I think, to what I'm reading here, and I could agree to, but I'd be nervous that you were starting to, uh, that this is opening up a door to reducing who the service was available to. Okay, I'll, I don't think that's the intention, but I'll pick that up at the end if that's helpful. Um, can I come to Kirsten Robb? Thank you. Thank you, Simon, for the answer before. Um, you said that in one month's time, the answer might be different in terms of information about the service. So would there be an opportunity to defer this to decision until we get more information to inform our decisions. For example, looking at a new service model, how much would those cost? Who, or who can we benchmark against for that particular service model? I wondered if that would be an option so that we could make the best decisions with the most information that we can have. I'll maybe let, that's a question to Suman. So if we could come to Suman and then I'll come to Margaret Walker. Suman. Uh, so that would be the decision of this executive committee. Again, in terms of the paper here in front of you today, and as the, uh, the chief executive of the council has already spoken to, in terms of the IGB setting its balanced budget, it requires to have a balanced budget set. It requires to do that by the 1st of April. 
Um, so there's a timeline that we need to work to within that. I appreciate that presents certain challenges. It has presented certain challenges for officers, uh, but that's that's the context within which we have to work. I'm very happy, as indeed of my team, to meet with individual members over the course of time to kind of get into some of the details to provide reassurance around whatever is decided by the executive committee here today as best we can. Right. Um, I see Margaret Walker's hand is up. If it's all right, Margaret, I'll come to you to sum up the debate. I, I would just like to, as the person that moved the amendment, um, I would just like to pick up some of the points that have come out of the the debate itself. Firstly, can I just refer people back to 4.1 in the paper? Now, 4.1 in the paper states that the service is currently available on request and there is no assessment and review function or eligibility criteria to access the service. Um, the next point, 4.2, states that there is the response service provided by SLC is more enhanced when compared to the family first model of response service provided by some other local authorities, um, and that that adds considerably to the overall cost of the service. I think the issue that we have is not just that we're an outlier with one of the biggest subsidies in Scotland. We are also providing a exceptional and a service that goes far beyond what our neighbouring authorities are providing for that low subsidy. And it suggests to me that there are ways to ensure that we continue to provide an excellent service, but also find efficiencies within the model. And I actually think, as I'm listening to the debate, that there's a bit of consensus about that in the across the chamber, that there is scope for us to find efficiencies within the current service model. I think we have to be realistic that finding efficiencies within that model is not likely to remove the need to increase the charge. And for that reason, the Labour Group has tried to navigate a way between the two objectives of trying to prevent a big hike in charges this year, um, while also um, finding a, a way in which the service can be sustained, but sustained in a more efficient way. Um, and that's really what point seven in the amendment that Margaret Walker had put forward is, is asking us to, to put back to the IJB, to ask them to consider as part of their, the work of reform that Suman has alluded to and as far, part of their fiscal sustainability and financial sustainability um, measures, that they actually consider how they can reduce costs and find efficiencies within the model so that we can insulate people against big increases in charges. There is no doubt that charges are going to have to go up. We don't live in the financial environment that, that we did a few years ago. There are huge pressures on budgets and both ourselves and our partners are going to have to find a way to balance those budgets. Um, if I can maybe just pick up some of the, the other points, I don't think that this is a case of where, unlike, I have to say, some of the previous budget amendments that the Council considered, where we have, frankly, the opposition party trying to balance the budget in the back of a black hole elsewhere. Um, we're not, for example, blowing a half million pound hole in the leisure and culture budget. Um, we're not blowing a £4.2 million pound hole in the budget of this council next year. What we are doing is we're saying to the IJB, you've asked us to help bridge a £700,000 gap with a proposal that is not acceptable to the committee. And the mood that I'm getting is it's not acceptable to anyone in the committee. So if that's the case, we have to find another way through this. Um, and what we're suggesting is here is a level of increase that we are prepared to accept just now to help help bridge that gap. Here is another way in which we think we could close some more of that gap, which is to suggest we look at the design of the model itself. There may, after that, I suspect after that, there probably will be some residual gap, and the discussions between the Council and the IJB are going to have to continue to try and get us into a place where that is, there is a financially sustainable solution to that. I would have to come back myself, I suppose, to the comments that Suman made right at the outset of the meeting, which is that compared to some of the budget challenges and decisions that this council and our health and social care partners are going to have to face over the next two or three years, this decision is one of the simpler ones the committee and the council is going to be asked to make because the budget pressures, the massacre of council budgets that, that we have seen over the past few years is not set to ease up. We faced, as I said at the council meeting, a 
medium-term financial strategy that sets out a future of cash, um, of, of flat cash settlements. And that means real terms cuts in each of the financial years uh, that lie ahead. That is not the place we need to be when we're trying to manage increased costs. So I simply say to the, the Council, I think we have to find a way through this. I'm not going to pretend it's easy, but I think that the approach that could perhaps secure some kind of consensus support uh, today that ma marries uh, an altogether a moderated increase in the charge with an option around service reform and with that further dialogue between the Council and the IJB over the coming months is the option that Margaret Walker, I think, set out very, very clearly um, a few minutes ago. Uh, and obviously that would be the one that I would be supporting today. Um, I'm going to... Margaret Walker wanted to speak... If, if there are no other contributions... So, sorry. Right. Well, I'll come to John Ross and then I'll come to Margaret Walker before we finish. John Ross. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much, Chair. Um, I was very interested in uh, what uh, Kirsten Robb had to say uh, about the idea of deferring this with no increase in charge until such times as we looked uh, at the possibility uh, of um, coming up with something uh, to present to the members, because this is quite a complex uh, situation. Not everybody understands the background to this. And, and if Kirsten was minded uh, to put forward that as an amendment to the amendment, uh, then I would certainly be supportive of it. Um, OK. Um, I'm going to... I'm going to just say, I think the point was made that we've still got the budget challenge to face just now, but I'll, I'll see if there are any other contributions. If not, I will come to Margaret Walker to just see if there's anything Margaret wanted to add. Margaret. No, you actually uh, more or less covered it um, in your remarks. I was going to respond to Joan's point about the £2.20. That is also partly in recognition of we do have the, you know, the, the highest subsidy in comparison with other areas. And that was in recognition of that and looking at that and getting the added income from it. Um, but just in conclusion, I think the cohort of people that this would impact, um, the cohort of people that would fall out of the scheme and the, the resultant impact will actually create um, more uh, a more negative impact um, on the service than, it, than actually just making sure that we keep these people protected and we keep them, them within um, the community alarm system um, and, and that we don't jeopardise that um, and risk, risk the resulting domino effect down the line. Um, and I would urge that there is a, you know, a cross-party support um, in supporting the amendment. Thank you. Chair, I just want to... to you know, we're at the point at which members are about to come to, to a decision and, and, and a vote potentially around us. I just want to be really clear so that um, members fully understand. When Suman's referring to this is a movable feast, largely what we're talking about is all partnerships across Scotland, or most of them, are looking at their charging regimes just now. So as comparing ourselves with a benchmark or comparing with today's benchmark, those benchmarks will move. Um, that's what he means by something's going to change over the next month. Uh, the second point I would just want to be clear on is if members take a decision to um, accept the amendment that's on the table or to accept a position of no increase, that puts the IGB's uh, budget into imbalance. The IGB is going to have to come together and meet and consider how to bridge that. Um, it is correct that members are looking towards option seven around here about a remodelling of the service. I need to be really clear, that's not going to be done in the next month or six weeks such that the IGB is going to be able to take a decision and say that will bridge the 700,000. They're going to have to consider their full budget and look for efficiencies around, or cuts effectively, around £700,000. It will only be if they're absolutely convinced that there is work done that will point to a particular value of saving that can be realised within 23-24 that they could use any of that. So um, just want to make sure that members don't believe 
the officers um, instructed by the IGB will go off, remodel over the next four to six weeks and come back and say, that's it, the, the, the gap is filled. That is not going to be the case. I really want to be clear around that, just to manage the expectations on this. These decisions will sit with the IGB and the IGB will have to take decisions in, on the basis of their delegated functions and their delegated budget. And unless it relates to a reserve matter like charging, then it's not going to be coming back to the Executive Committee to agree. It will be sitting with the delegated responsibility of the IGB. Thanks. OK. Um, Maureen Chalmers. Um, thanks, Chair. I'm just conscious that some of the work that's been set out by Suman and is in the paper, and it was presented to the IGB yesterday, um, is that there are there is a number of things that are going to be reviewed, possible redesigns, and possible future requests to the council for increase in charges. And I'm just thinking that the community alert system doesn't sit in isolation. This is a, a major piece of work that is being planned, um, but as the Chief Executive just said, won't, be ha won't happen overnight. And therefore, item seven, although you know, that, that's the way, that's the sense of direction, this is a much bigger piece of work. And do we want things to come back in bits and pieces, or do we want a set of things to come back together to us for decision at a later stage? When, because this will be a full piece of work. I suspect it won't go off and do the community alarm system and uh, out with everything else. So are, are, are we thinking about perhaps requesting that that piece of work comes back is a complete piece of work for us to consider in some depth, um, given the likely um, piece of work that Simon and his team have got ahead of them. And I'm just thinking also, given we are where we are, we maybe just need a wee breather, um, because this is complex, and just to kind of make sure that we take the right decision today, if there's a possibility of a wee five-minute break to do that. But that was my question as well. OK, I'm going to ask Suman to pick that up. And just in the first instance, Suman. Thank you, and thank you for the question. So this very much follows on from the Chief Executive's remarks a second ago. So for clarity, and, and I should have been clear earlier, um, this will only come back to the Executive Committee if it's about a change in charging. It will not be coming back here, in the way, as, as the Chief Executive said, if there's a change to the service model. That will be a decision for the Integration Joint Board. Council would be informed of that, but it's not, and Council may have a view on that, but it would not be for Council to make a decision on that. Uh, now, there are other areas where we do have charging that's undertaken, and again, those are retained responsibilities of the Council. Uh, so it would only be the case that actually, as, and again, having only received this, in terms of number seven, if it was a suggestion about making some adjustments plus a change to the, a cha to the charging being requested, it would only be the change in the charging being requested to come back here. Right. Okay. Just to pick up where we've got, to, I've got a number of things to work through. Can I just? We have an amendment from Margaret Walker, which I think becomes a motion. Is there another amendment coming forward? Would be my next question. I've also had a request for a break. So if it's right, and we get right, is there? There isn't another amendment coming forward. Okay, can I can I just this to, to deal with this issue? I was going to move to a vote then. If there's no objections, can I move to the vote? That, can I, well, we've got a recommendation from Margaret Walker. Can I ask if we can we agree the recommendations? Agreed. We're agreed. Yep. The item is um, dealt with. Okay, then that is agreed. Can I maybe just say in summary before we move on? Um, and this is my own my own thoughts. Um, there were within that debate, I think, a number of useful suggestions, and I think there's also a pattern emerging when it comes to decisions taken by the Council and decisions taken by Council partners that require some kind of interaction with the Council. And I do think there were some useful points that came up in that debate. If you take the party politics out of it, there were actually some useful points about governance and our approach to service reform. One of the suggestions approved at the committee eh, at the council meeting last month, is still last month, was that we convened this budget sounding board. Um, I would suggest that actually that is a place where we want to have a bit of a safe space for discussion about how we approach some of these big issues that are coming down the line. And that is not to supplant or take away the proper democratic public role of ourselves as decision makers, but 
to ha perhaps just agree uh, in a way in which we can approach these, particularly these govern governance issues on a cross-party basis. Right. Um, I'm going to come now to the final item, which is urgent business. There have been no items of urgent business intimated. Can I therefore bring the, the meeting to a close and thank everyone for attendance today? Thank you.